So we're going to start though um, with Ian McQuirter. As I've said, he's the political commentator for the Sunday Herald and the Herald. He joined the BBC straight from Edinburgh University, where he became the Scottish political correspondent in 1987. In 1989, he moved to London to present political programmes for BBC television, such as Westminster Live, as well as one-off documentaries for BBC Two, including one on the House of Commons art collection. At the same time, he became successively a weekly op-ed political columnist for The Scotland on Sunday, The Scotsman and The Observer. And in 1989, he returned to Scotland to launch The Sunday Herald and to present BBC's um, Holyrood Live TV programmes from the Scottish Parliament. He continues to appear as a political commentator on the BBC and publishes his writing on his excellent political blog, Now and Then. He is also rector of the University of Edinburgh and I believe he's been recently protesting about the impending cuts alongside the students, so we can ask him a bit more about those experiences later. So, Ian McCarthy. Well, thank you, Kirsten, for that uh, uh, exhaustive character of V time and also for the kind suggestion that my scribblings might have contributed to uh, the current upsurge in revolt against socialism for the rich. Uh, sadly, I don't think that many people actually read this Sunday Herald, but never mind. It's very encouraging to see that there is some degree of opposition, some degree of challenge uh, being presented to uh, the way in which uh, this economic crisis was resolved. Resolved uh, in the interests of bankers, in the interests of finance capital, uh, and against the interests of ordinary uh, people. Um, democracy in crisis, just to address the, the questions at hand, yes, democracy is always in, in crisis, it has to be in crisis. If democracy is not in crisis, indeed, uh, it dies. And um, sanctioned protest, does it have any uh, impact? I would say uh, yes, it does, it has to, and democracy is inconceivable without um, uh, popular protest. I'm going to kind of uh, uh, look at these uh, very, very broad issues, narrowing it down to a uh, few remarks about the student protests, which, as Kirsten said, I've been involved in as rector of Edinburgh University, so I've had a I've seen that very much from the inside. Comparing that with some other protests of the past, like the Poltex uh, protests in the 1990s, uh, and then some reflections of the Scottish Parliament, which curiously is itself a product of protest, but is also now, in many respects, uh, an obstacle to it. It's a kind of dialectic, dialectic if you like, the old Marxist uh, phrase, dialectic of uh, political power and protest, which I'm kind of looking at. But let's start with the uh, students and their uh, activities and whether or not um, that really is uh, just a, an outburst of naive, youthful enthusiasm or whether it, has, whether or not it has any political content. I just want to quote something from Deborah Orr, uh, you may have, might have seen earlier this week in The Guardian. <clears throat> she said that, uh, just explaining why people like her weren't out in the streets with the students, she said that the truth is that they're all, these are the older people, they're all too wise to waste their energy in something so silly. Protesting against the cuts is like protesting against water's stubborn habit of flowing downwards. Pointless unless you are a committed anarchist, in which case everything is worth protesting about. And uh, she goes on to say that fiscal discipline really is necessary unless a nation chooses to default and thereby turn its back on the rest of the world, volunteering as a pariah state in some sort of crazed, chaotic limbo. And I thought this was quite an astonishingly, curmudgeonly, uh, attitude, particularly coming from one of the country's leading uh, left-wing newspapers, um, curmudgeonly in that it's, uh, it's suggesting that this is just a completely uh, futile exercise, that these students are just going out in the streets uh, to vent their fury in an unconstructed manner. Now the, uh, the Intifada, as, as I would call it, which is now running through the universities uh, in Britain, it's not just been one event, it's been a series of mass protests, there'll be another one on Wednesday, 34 universities were uh, occupied in the course of last week. Um, it has been uh, a very significant, indeed, a defining moment, I think, uh, not just uh, in the, uh, for, for society students, but for society as a whole. And of course, there are very clear echoes with uh, political events in the past. <clears throat> Most notably, and we were talking about this at lunchtime, comparison with the events of uh, May, June 1968 in Paris, which really launched um, the last kind of cycle of large-scale mass popular protest, and that of course was, was led by students. Um, students have always been in the vanguard of these protests. We go back to 
uh, the, the 19th century, even the 18th century, or particularly the 19th century and the 1905 uh, uh, Russian Revolution, that's the, the earlier one, not the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, 1917, but the earlier 1905 democratic one, that was, of course, uh, largely led by students. Students will always be in the vanguard of these political movements for very obvious reasons. They don't have mortgages, they don't have families, um, their, their views of the world are not ossified, and they, know, they don't yet have uh, a, a financial stake in the status quo. So they are always going to be the people who, if you like, are the weather vane uh, of, uh, of politics. What was the student protest about? What is the student protest about? Well, as I'm sure you know, it's essentially about the privatization of higher education that uh, <clears throat> the government has accepted proposals to uh, increase fees, south of the border at least, uh, to £90,000 a year. These are to be paid back by students after they graduate, after they're earning over 21000 a year. Uh, and uh, the, the, the debt they will incur as a consequence of this, something like fifty or £60,000, if you take, take account of their uh, living expenses and the other costs that students have. Students already uh, leave uh, university burdened with debt, on average about £17,000. As a result of these measures, if they're introduced, they will be leaving with debts of 50 or 60,000 pounds, and these debts will increase year by year by RPI plus inflation. This is something that, that, uh, that people haven't really, uh, haven't really clocked yet, that this debt that the student, students will be expected to take on is an expanding one. It will, it will grow by about 6 or 7% a year. So when you have a government saying, well, you know, students should put something back into society because throughout their working lives they earn 100,000 pounds on average more than non-graduates, this has to be put in its proper financial perspective. The debt that the students will be taking on, the expanding debt, uh, will be easily £100,000 in the course of, of their, their lifetimes. And most of them, according to an analysis by the Institute of Fiscal Studies, is that most of them will still have debts uh, after the 30 years in which they're supposed to be repaying. So this debt burden is going to be a very substantial one. Uh, it's also about the marketization of universities because behind uh, the Brown Report was this principle that universities would start competing with each other, that you would have a market in higher education. Um, and this has been very attractive to a number of uh, British universities uh, uh, who have been seeing this as an opportunity, particularly the older established the elite universities, the Oxford Cambridge, the Russell Group universities. They see this as an opportunity to uh, strike out in their own, rather like Ivy League universities in America, and uh, be able to charge very substantial fees, uh, and through these fees be able to, 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 to mount uh, world-class uh, research and provide world-class teaching. So there's a big incentive for them to do this. Now obviously this is uh, very contrary to the principle of, um, of higher education, particularly in Scotland, enshrined in this uh, uh, slightly enigmatic phrase, the democratic intellect, which is about an idea that, uh, that um, education is not just for the personal advancement of the individual, but is for society as a whole. The society as a whole benefits from higher education, uh, and it's the intellectual capital of society that we're contributing to, and therefore it should be financed primarily out of, out of taxation. Anyway, that's, that's what the, the whole issue was about, but it had very rapidly became much more than that, and this was partly as a result of the students' experience actually out on demonstrations. Uh, I was reliving my, <laughs> my misspent youth to, to a certain extent on the 10th of November when um, I went down on the overnight bus with 2,000 students from, uh, from Scotland, not all on the same bus, in a fleet of buses, but 2,000 students from Scotland, even though, uh, for, officially at any rate, um, these uh, fees are not going to apply in Scotland, but the students nevertheless consider this an important enough issue uh, to get off their butts and get on the, the overnight bus down to London. And, I mean, you know, it's, these demonstrations always take the same uh, uh, form. You, you have the Socialist uh, Workers' Party, uh, who are inevitably all over it like a rash. Uh, nobody knows how they've managed to survive, because nearly all the other Marxist uh, splinters and fragments from the 1960s have all died off years ago. Either that or they've become Tories. Uh, but somehow the Socialist Workers' Party fights on, still believing the revolution is around the corner. The only thing was that they, they, they were responsible for that placard you may have seen, which was fuck fees, uh, with the asterisks obviously, but fuck fees. Uh, which I thought was slightly, uh, slightly misleading because it, it kind of suggested more like prostitution than anything else. Um, you know, an appeal for fuck fees. But anyway, 
That's, um, that's by the by. They, they were all over it. They were getting the students to all saying, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, education for the masses, not just for the ruling classes. That's a, that really took me back 30 years because I remember, I remember uh, saying exactly the same kind of thing on uh, similar demonstrations many years ago. Uh, um, and, and no ifs, no buts, uh, no to education cuts. That's another of the, uh, these uh, megaphone delivered uh, phrases and uh, chants. Now, the students were taking all this with a, a high degree of, um, of good humour, and uh, you know, this is, uh, many of them were involved in a kind of ironic demonstration this time because they knew that what they were doing was to a certain extent a kind of cliche. But that doesn't alter the fact that their experience of being together on this uh, action did actually provoke an enormous amount of debate. What you forget about um, these uh, events is that they take place very slowly. Most of the time it's involved with people traveling uh, or people sitting around waiting to go somewhere or people standing in the cold waiting for something to happen. That's essentially what protest uh, involves. And that gives them a, a great opportunity for people to discuss their, their circumstances and to reflect upon their own political views. And that's exactly what happened. The other thing is that people come uh, very rapidly up against the uh, institutions of the state. Uh, um, in in the, the police, I have to say, the police, that I, as I saw them on that particular march on the 10th of November, this was the one you remember when uh, no one was expecting more than 5,000 to, to attend. In fact, it was over 50,000 turned up and marched along Parliament Square, Whitehall, um, along to outside Tate Britain. I have no idea why they chose Tate Britain as a destination, but that was, that was a police decision. Um, I have to say the police seemed uh, pretty reasonable all the way along. That may be because the police were co caught completely by surprise and hadn't actually put many of them on display. This is why um, there happened to be very little police, in fact, no observable police presence at all around um, the headquarters of the Conservative, Conservative Party, which even the students' own organisers had identified as a potential uh, site of conflict. <clears throat> uh, if you're a conspiratorial bent, you might think the police deliberately uh, invited, if you like, the anarchist element among the students to uh, make a situation as protest uh, in the uh, offices of the Conservative Party. The better to demonstrate to the Tories how important it is to keep um, uh, the police well fed and keep their uh, salaries up. I don't think, uh, sadly, I, I'd love to believe that, but I don't, I, don't think that, I don't think the police are really capable of that kind of strategic <laughs> organisation, certainly not in my experience.